it's time to take a few steps back and take inventory. What are my skill sets? What's in your arsenal? What do I have here that I can make produce? Guess what? Find a mentor. <laughs> Shamika's right there. <laughs> Find a mentor. Find someone to really, another pair of eyes to really look at your business and what you're doing in your industry, especially if it's someone that keeps their eye on different types of industries, because maybe that's where innovation comes. When you start doing things within your industry, if you adopt things from other industries and bring it into your own, guess what? That might be the secret sauce you needed to really blow things up. All right, y'all, welcome to this conversation. I'm super excited that I got my girls here. We're going to talk about some stuff. We're going to talk about money. Some of y'all get uncomfortable talking about money. We're going to talk about money today. We're going to talk about the economy. We're going to talk about the, I was about to say Green Valley Ranch. That is, <laughs> <man>. that is not. <laughs> We're going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank, all the things. Here's why I want to have this conversation and why I think this conversation is important. Back in 2008, at during the economic downfall, the economic decline, the, what did they call it? The Great Recession is what they called it. Um, it was in the real estate industry and I was in the real estate mortgage industry and we were making money hand over fist left and right. It just seemed like it was never going to end. And the next thing you know, one day we woke up to go to work and my friends were calling me like, hey, there's a padlock on the door to my office. Like all my stuff isn't there. And all these banks just closed like overnight. All of these lending banks just closed overnight. And back then I was young. I was like in my early thirties, I didn't really, I hadn't lived long enough to see a cycle of economic downturn happen. And so I just assumed that things were on the up and it's going to keep going up and going up. And the next thing I was spending through my savings, trying to keep my business afloat. The next thing you know, I was being moved out of my house and facing foreclosure. Next thing you know, I was selling my cars. Next thing you know, I was in the welfare office. Mm -hmm. Two degrees, had a multiple six figure business to nothing to not even the ability to try to make money, trying to figure out how to make money and switching things up very quickly. And we are having some signs of some similar things right now. They've been going on for a very long time and not a lot of people are talking about it. Silicon Valley Bank has brought up a lot of things for a lot of people. It's like the thing that's ringing the bell. And so I wanna talk about how you protect your legacy. How do you protect yourself? How do you make sure you survive through this so you don't end up in the welfare office like I did? And so I've brought two of my most favorite people in the world, especially when it comes to the area of money, to have this conversation with me today. And so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And while they're introducing themselves, I'm going to share this live stream out into a couple of other places. You guys can go in any order, but tell the people who you are so that they know who they're listening to. And just before you guys do that, this is just going to be a fly on the wall conversation. So we're also going to be checking the chat. If you guys have questions that come up for you, throw those questions out. We'll be answering them. We're just going to talk and let you guys listen to the conversation that we're having. So you guys go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll jump right in. Okay. Carla, you want to go? Yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. So my name is LaShawn Holland and I work primarily with professionals, mission-driven, dri freedom-seeking professionals on teaching them how to scale their business and on investing. And so we do a lot around investing, even with some of our Higher in clients, investing, insurance, that's my mojo. Her very thing. My name is Nicola. I've, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an investor, and I have my old software development company. We're involved a lot in the blockchain area on the development side. And we're also keeping an eye out on a lot of different projects. We usually, what we do is we either do start businesses and then sell them off, or we partner with people on an equity arrangement where we're guiding them through the startup or the scale up of their businesses. And more than anything, I think that what we look for is projects where everybody wins. And, uh, and I think as a personal mission, and this is, I think where we all three of us connect is that not only are we the breakthrough generation in our lineage when it comes to money, but in being able to bring other people alongside so that they can learn to generate, create wealth, 
grow their wealth and then protect their wealth. And I think I love that this is what's always on top of mind awareness for Shamika. And that's why she surrounds herself around people. But I love the fact that she always comes back and brings it to maybe those people that are a few steps behind in the journey so that they can look out for what those red flags are and what those mind, those, what the minefield can have there when they're growing their business. So I'm excited to have this conversation. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, the thing that I love the most about you guys is how modest you are about what you do in the world. <laughs> so the thing that I love is that you guys are so modest. Like Michelle's like, yeah, I'm not working. Really, I do. I'm the insurance. She's wearing her own branded shirt. Like she's an entrepreneur. She's got multiple, her hands in multiple things. There's a lot to both of you. Then I know it, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I just want you guys to know that these aren't people who are just reading the Wall Street Journal and coming to you and telling you what they think based on what they read. They are in it up to their neck with entrepreneurship and with building wealth for themselves and their families. And they've been at it for a while. So let's jump into this conversation. I'm not quite sure where I want to start. I guess let's start with Silicon Valley Bank, right? I think there's some things people need to know and understand it. And I, it's been fun talking to both of you guys. Well, Sean, I've been watching your posts, so I'm considering myself talking to you about what's happening with Silicon Valley Bank, because I don't think people really understand and they only understand what people are sharing. Two of the things that I think are really important for us to understand as entrepreneurs and business owners, especially if you're making money and you have your money in the bank, that Carly, you were sharing this with me and it blew my mind because I didn't even think about it that way, that when, Sinico when the FDIC took over Silicon Valley Bank, they listed everyone who had money in the bank as a creditor to the bank. Now, I don't think I don't I, where there's two things going on. One is the branding of what the banking institution is as a whole and what it supposedly represents. And that's what we're trained to believe it's the branding of how secure it is and how you have your money in the bank. It's kind of like putting it, opening a vault, putting it in there. You expect it's there. It's in their vault, but it's not. And and so I think it's interesting how we're trained to believe that it's a storage of value. And we have not stored our value there. What we've done is we've deposited money in there. We're a depositor and we're a creditor. And the second that we do, that we sign all that paperwork, and that's why it takes forever to open a bank account. It's such a pain in the rear. But it's because we are signing off. We're sending away all of our money, basically. And we're telling them, we're giving them power of attorney. We're saying, go do whatever you want with my money. And they have a rule that is so lax. It used to be they can lend up to 10 times what they have deposited. They can now lend up to 12 times what they have deposited in the bank. Your money is not there. It is just digital numbers on there. You're playing with digital money, basically. And so to be able to go and deposit the money, turn it over and tell them, go ahead and do what you please with it. And when I come back and I need it, give it to me, but only in the tranches you can fulfill. Because any one of you, you go to the bank and you ask for 25,000 cash, they're going to tell you, come back on Wednesday yeah. because they don't have it at hand to do that. And on what happened with, that's exactly what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. And then they went and the, the CEO did an announcement that got some people worried. And as LaShawn would know in investments is it's all about the emotions and that's what's driving the market. And so people got scared and they did a little bit, they did a tiny run on the bank, but that means they went, started taking money out, especially tech companies and in large sums. And so they said, you know what? We don't have enough to cover all of this. So let's go sell some corporate bonds. And when they started doing that on a Friday before the markets closed, they closed over the weekend, the FDIC said, whoa, what are they doing? And you have to understand, the FDIC never comes in the middle of the day. They'll wait till the end of the day, and then they'll come in and they close the take over the bank. They took over midday. I don't even know if that's ever been done, but they took over midday, and they said, no, we need to get a hold of this because the FDIC, it's an insurance policy. They're on the hook for the money for 250000 And they don't have it. And they do not have it. And they certainly don't have it if it happens for everyone. They needed to get in there. That the FDIC insures like $9 trillion worth of deposits, yet they only have like $125 billion. Exactly. 
So the math is not mathing. They don't even have enough money. And I think what people probably don't realize is almost 90%. They had over $90 billion in bonds. And so what triggered it when they tried to raise more money because interest rates went up, when interest rates increased, it just nullifies bonds. And so they were so bond heavy, they couldn't raise the money in time to. And so once they got downgraded and people got afraid and started doing what Carmer said, they did a run on the bank, the FDIC came in. But the issue really is a bond issue. The bonds are what really caused them just to go up. But every asset class has a life cycle. And so bonds have anywhere between a 28, 30 year life cycle. And so when the, and one of the issues that we have going on in our economy right now is that we have so many different bubbles. We have so many different things that's affecting our economy at the same time, which is historic because we've never had so many bubbles together at one time that- Run down some of those, Lashon. What'd you say? Can you run down some of those bubbles right now? Just the hand. Yeah, absolutely. And so some of the things that have been affecting our market that people aren't really paying attention to, it is the inflation, it is the interest, but COVID showed us that we were so dependent on globalization, right? And so now we're at a time where we're ending globalization because we had all the problems with supply chain and chips and all of that stuff. And then the beginning of protectionism where the countries are starting to say, hey, I'm going to bring my stuff back home and we're going to build different relationships and start doing it. So that affects our market. The war in Ukraine is affecting our market. And so I don't think people understand it's the inflation, it's the interest, it's the globalization issue and the protectionism. It's our jobs, our job numbers tech companies. One of the things when you look at the financial industry, especially in the market, one of the other sectors that are tied to it is the energy sector and also like our utilities sector. And so those start to go down too. And so it's not just knowing, it's not good enough to say, okay, I have my money in the market. It's knowing where to have it in the market. And right now, during times like this, how long you're going to keep it there. The bonds was a big issue because they had Silicon Valley Bank had so much of their holdings in bonds. And so when the interest rates, if I am buy, if I bought a bunch of 3% bonds, right, and the interest rate goes up to 10%, my bonds are no good anymore. So it caught that steep drop just caused they wreaked havoc for SBB. So I want to bring this down to like layman's term for the average CEO. LaShawn, you did a post the other day and I giggled a little bit, but I was like, I'm almost in that boat too, where you said you had a couple of million millionaire, million, million dollar CEOs reach out to you and say, hey, oh my gosh, my money's in the bank. What should I do? And so I, I remember that post because I was like, don't tell me you got all your money in one bank. That, that, that was m- literally my response. Do not tell me you have all your money in one bank. And they did. All three of them actually had it in one bank. It's easy for them to do. But the FDIC only insures up to $250,000. And so for most people that are afraid, if you don't have, for the general population, they don't have $250,000 in the bank. And this is really the concern starts to come in for people who have more than $250,000. And you have to be able to spread them out, diversify across different accounts and different banks. One of the things that I'm really big on is segregating my money. Like, I I don't believe in living off 100% of my income, but I also believe in segregating so I can give my money instructions. And when I say segregate, I mean put them in different accounts for different purposes. I want to talk about that. I want both of you, if you are open to sharing, what are some of the things that you do to protect yourself before a situation like this comes up? So you talked about segregating your money, LaShawn. Carla, what are some things that, that you do to ensure that you don't get caught in a situation like with Silicon Valley Bank where all your money's in one place or it's all in a bank? Yeah, and I think one of the things that Sean is correct that the people that their ears immediately perked up are people that have over two hundred fifty thousand dollars cash somewhere. And does it, is it all in the same bank? No, it cannot be. But even if you don't have two hundred fifty thousand dollars, your ears need to perk up because guess what? 
LaShawn just told you, the FDIC does not have enough to cover even all of those $250,000, less than $250,000 accounts. That's what the insurance policy is for. And guess what? When they cash in on the insurance policy, in most cases, it goes straight to the bank first, and then they have to pay the creditors with it. So are you going to get your money? Who knows? So even if you are not at the $250,000 and above, you know, what are the things you need to look at? You need to look at whole life policy. You need to look at a life insurance policy. That's basically what you're doing when you're putting in the bank, except you're letting somebody else get a policy on your money. You're letting the bank get a policy on your money. And so you want to look at life insurance policies. You want to look in. I'll tell you what personally we're looking into. We're looking into gold. We've been doing that since heavily since June of last year. And we're talking about gold mine investing. We're putting a project together with that. We have blockchain investment. So the things we look at is technology, where technology is going that is actually going to impact society, period. So blockchain is one of those. That's what we're heavily invested in is a blockchain. We're heavily invested in cryptocurrencies. And those are, I know that they get a bad rap, but it's just like anything else long-term, it's going to be there if that particular cryptocurrency has enough of a solid project and usability and demand that it's going to have. Not the speculating one. Yeah, people can make quick money with that, speculating with some sort of cryptocurrency trading and stuff like that. That's fine. But I'm talking about investing in long-term projects that are going to be used in the next five to 10 years, positioning yourself that way. We're nodes on blockchains. That's another thing. And looking at what companies, because here's another thing, what companies are going to be at the forefront of this change that's happening in the global economy and in the domesticating economies again. And so what companies are going to be the ones that are going to be here on the other side of things? And I think those are the, and some of them are not the ones you think, the tried and true that have been here for 20, 30 years. Some of these are the innovative companies that are coming out right now that are going to change the way that we normally do things in a better and more sophisticated way. Absolutely. I wanted to piggyback too on one of the things that Carla said. When we start, when you start seeing signs in the market that the dollar is losing its value, commodities is where you want to go. I've been buying gold and silver since the early 2000s, tons of it. I'm a really big fan of commodities. I'm a bigger fan probably of silver. Because silver is gives you, you get, depending on where you go in on your spot price, you can get five to 20 times growth more than gold because gold is more expensive, but silver is way more plentiful and they use it in so many things. And so you just have to start to learn the triggers for cycles. It has helped me tremendously. I'm like you in 2008, we were heavy in real estate. I'm buying waterfront properties. We buy land. And then the market crashed and I learned that I can't write this land all on my taxes because it doesn't have a building on it. And you start learning all of these things. I'm like, I am losing money hand over fist. So I probably should start learning about cycles. And so I was determined that I was never going to be caught with my pants down again. And because your money has to stay moving, but it shouldn't be flowing in the same sectors of the market all the time like you know, markets change and so we see that with the dollar we see it down so it's it has no strength and so you have your gold and your silver and your other commodities which are big cryptocurrency like carla said is not going anywhere i'm a big fan i have my clients at my event wealthy revolution live to start buying xrp back in 2020 and it's one of my favorite cryptos. I'm not a, a really big Bitcoin fan. I love XRP. But like she said, crypto is not going anywhere. We just experience a winner. Winners are okay. It's when you go in and you make money. I make my biggest spread on the downturns in the market. Yeah. And so I'm not a real long term. I don't hold stuff long. I want to go in. If I see an opportunity in the charts for me to make 400% of my money today, that's what I'm going to go for. So my money employ it a lot. I love that you said you're making biggest spreads when you when it's a downturn, right? Because we're heading into an economic downturn and there are a lot of people who are looking at it like the sky is falling, like a chicken little situation. And the real truth is based on what you're saying, LaShawn, and what Carla's saying, and I'm loving hearing you guys talk together. This is the first time I've ever put you guys together before. I'm like, hey, 
pretty much do the same thing, just in different ways. Uh, what I love about what you said is if you understand what's coming, you can come out on top because economic downturns are not when you start to really penny pinch and hunker down necessarily. It's you're being smart, right? It's opportunity. So it's understanding where the opportunities are. Carla just gave a big tip about looking at, based on what LaShawn said earlier, looking at we're looking at domesticating more of what we do. What are the companies that are going to be on the forefront of that? What are the new technologies that are coming out? Everybody's talking about AI. Are you just talking about it for the fun of using it in your business to write your next signature talk? Please don't do that. Anyway, <laughs> but what else can you be looking at it for? Where can you be on the investing side of that? I want to backtrack this conversation to whole life insurance policies because you guys like glazed over it a little bit. And I think you glazed over it because for you it's so basic. That's like the bare minimum of what you I, should be doing. I don't use life insurance. I'm a huge fan of IULs, annuities. I'm a big fan of Kaizen. And because you can do so much with it. It's a system that's called infinite banking that a lot of people don't know about. And so wealthy people, they negate banks altogether because they use their life insurance policy. And I put policies, several policies on my kids as soon as I got their social security number in the mail when they were born. And so we use those things to be able to go out and get more assets and build businesses and stuff. And I don't think people really look at insurance as an asset class, but it is absolutely an asset class when you can get a policy that has cash value. And it's even better if you get one that has other free riders with it, like disability or chronic or critical care that you can use because you never know what's going to happen in your future. But we don't, we're not programmed to know about the infinite banking system, so we don't do it. You hear life insurance and people tend to treat life insurance like they're going to die the moment they sign up for it. And it's not like that. It's an asset class that you can actually use it for benefit. We mostly why, why we're we average person focused on the death benefit of life insurance as opposed to understanding how to use it as a tool in the vehicle to live and to be able to create wealth. Like if you think about how the Rockefeller family built their wealth, it was rooted in these life insurance policies. And I think the way that they have it structured is wild. Like when I started reading about this, it's like 14 generations deep. And when it passes on to the next day, yes, every person who is a part of the trust has to have a, one of these life insurance, the types of life insurance policies that we're talking about. It's an absolute must. When you pass on that life insurance policy goes into the trust, thus creating more wealth. The trust then gives instructions on what to do. You are required to use 30% of the money to acquire. You must acquire real estate and properties. You must acquire some businesses, all of those things. I found out that the Rockefellers are in deep with some SBCUs, SBCUs, HBCUs. I was like, what? It's one of the investments that they have made that has helped to build their wealth. And then when they pass down the money from to the next generation, they don't get it all. It's like a percentage goes down to the next generation and then the next percentage of it gets passed on. So you don't get to spend it's all always working for them and they're living for the interest. There's over a hundred and something of them that gets money every year from the interest that they have set up in trust. I think that it's really odd to see the differences between the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts who are essentially were broke because they didn't take care of the money. Yeah. They didn't take care of the principal. And so they just spend without having any new money come in. And so by the time Anderson Cooper comes along, Anderson is like, hey, what happened to all the Vanderbilt money? that?" I don't, Shamika, have you read the book, What Would the Rockefellers Do? That's the book I'm in right now where I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, wait. Depot Island is another really good one because it really gives you the history of how our banking system illegally was set up. Yeah. <laughs> the whole Federal Reserve is not even federal. Caden <laughs> in with the book again? I think it's In Search of Jekyll Island. In Search of Jekyll uh, Yep. Thanks for that. Here's, I want to say this for those of you who are just joining us. The one of the main reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is because a lot of you listening to us right now would never be able to even listen in on something like this. You would have no idea. This is me in 2008, just working to make a living 
and thinking out, this is how I was going to get to my millions is just make more money and make more money and make more money, not realizing that all of these vehicles and all of these ways of thinking exist. And this is how the rich get richer and richer. But if you're not in these rooms, which is why I want you to be a fly on the wall, you don't even know what to start looking for. Even as I grow my company and my wealth right now, I'm constantly tapping on you guys to ask questions because I can't just go to a regular life insurance provider or a regular, they don't know. They don't even know who it is. They're going to be thinking, unfortunately, they're going to be thinking in the same thought pattern that is just about the death benefit. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk to business owners about this economy right now and some things they could be doing to shore themselves up. We've seen a lot of layoffs in the last couple of years and people giggle about it and get upset that these companies are laying off so many people. We've got the big quit happening right now where everybody's quitting jobs. There's like, is it 35 million people have quit their jobs? Yeah. And about 15 million of them are jumping into entrepreneurship and starting businesses. Doing so an economic downturn is not a bad thing, but you've got to know what you're in for. So what are we protecting? What are we doing? What are we looking for? How do we make sure that we're here for the long haul and not out of business in a couple of years? I think it's so important that during this time that we pay attention to our numbers. A lot of business owners don't understand run rate, burn rate. They don't know what in the world is going on. And so it's looking not that I don't believe in having a scarcity mindset, but if it's not producing, then we got to get rid of it. And so looking at those areas of your business, what's making you money, what's not making you any money. And if it's not making money, it's not making sense. And so maybe the pivot is into something different. I never expected to do anything with Blackwell, never in a million years. I read the book, The Sword and the Shield, during Christmas with my son. We had a conversation about what it is that we're really called to do in the earth. So I got the shirts made for myself and my family. And people just kept asking me, it was such a conversation starter. And people kept asking me, we did it. Well, this landed me on stage at South by Southwest floors, the shade room, never in a million years. Well, it was a pivot also for us. I hadn't planned on doing it. I did it as, to be honest, I did it to shut my son up. I was like, okay, stop asking me to sell it. I'm gonna order 200 pieces and leave me alone. In 48 hours, it sold out. And so now he's like, I told you mom. And then the deal with floors dropped in our lap. And I just, I never expected it. And so it's looking at those other areas in your business that could bring in resources too. But knowing your numbers by far, you you can't control what you don't know. So, you know, and you can't multiply what you don't manage. You've got to know your numbers. Carla, before you jump in, Sean, LaShawn, just real quick, short explanation about how to run a rate and a burn rate, because I know some people are Googling right now. Oh, oh, just how much we're bringing in and how much we're spending. <laughs> That's it. That was simplest error. There you go. So your run rate is how much you're bringing in. Your burn rate is right. how much you're spending. And you need those to not outdo each other. Well, you need one to outdo the other. And you're making more money than you're spending. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then looking at the things is just not producing. If it's not producing, it's not making money. It's not making sense. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Carly, you want to chime in here? Yeah, I think that looking at the Great Recession back then, there was quite a few people that were displaced. And it really, we're seeing something similar happening now, but I believe it'll be 10 times as, as high. And it's because I don't think people realize the pandemic shut down. I think that people don't still don't understand the implications of it. We have not been seeing the implications of it in an economy from the economy standpoint at a global scale. And so I think that when things opened back up and they started reporting the number of jobs and everybody's like, oh, great, we're doing wonderful. No, those are people just starting to get back to work and they were, there's still many more that are not and they're displaced now. And the economy has like pretty much wiped out the businesses they were working in or even the industries they were working in for a while and they have to innovate. And so. I think that it is a great time for change, it, to embrace change. And to, even if you're 
change adverse and you you freak out with it, I think it is a perfect time. It's a perfect storm to really start evaluating your skill sets. Even if you have your business, if your business is getting hit pretty hard, I have someone who is in an insurance business and every day, every month, her checks are just declining. Just And this is even before the pandemic. It just accelerated. Why? Because technology is around, because the insurance companies, she's an insurance broker, the insurance companies are now taking the clients themselves. And so it's wiping out the whole insurance broker model. And so she needs to find what she's going to do next. So even if you have your own business, it's a, it's time to really look at whether you were in corporate America, whether you were it, having your own business, it's time to take a few steps back and take inventory. What are my skill sets? What are what is my background experience? Where does it all come into some unique offering? If maybe it is switching completely, what's in your arsenal? What do I have here that I can make produce that maybe was something that I had in, as an idea, but I haven't really given it much attention? Guess what? Find a mentor. <laughs> Shamika's right there. <laughs> Find a mentor. Find someone to really another pair of eyes to really look at your business and what you're doing in your industry and figure out where, especially if it's someone that um, keeps their eye on different types of industries, because maybe that's where innovation comes. When you start doing things within your industry, if you adopt things from other industries and bring it into your own, guess what? That might be the little, the secret sauce you needed to really blow things up. But here's the thing. I think that people get very entrenched in the idea of I have to persevere. And yes, you do, but you're not married to the business. You're not married to the business. Find, innovate, and you'll be able to, if you change with the times, guess what? You'll be one of those success stories at the end of it, at the end of all of this. I think what's beautiful about what you're saying and what's something to watch out for, guys, is this is not about having a knee-jerk reaction to what's happening in the economy. She's talking about innovation. She's talking about paying attention. LaShawn said it too. Like, don't be married to what you're doing. Find a way to show up for what's working now and be willing to release what you currently have because if it's declining, right? If your burn rate and your run rate aren't looking right, then you need to figure out what ha what has to happen. What What is working right now? What industries are working right now? I'm cheap. My computer is about to die, y'all. I thought I was fully loaded up. LaShawn, you were saying some things that you wanted to share. Go ahead and share with them. I'm going to move to a different spot because I need to plug in my computer. Go ahead and share with them those three points or three or four points that you gave because I think that's a really good baseline starting point for everybody right now. Get a pen and paper if you're listening and watching and basically put some check boxes next to it. And if you have it, check it off. If you don't have it, get your life. Absolutely. I think also, in addition to what Carla was saying and I mentioned earlier, is having enough adequate emergency savings or liquidity. In seasons like this, liquidity is king. You know, they say cash is king. Liquidity is very important because one of the things that banks do in downturns is they close the doors to their coffers, which is really your money. The second thing is look into commodities, like we said earlier, gold, silver, I'm big on wind and water and the energy also, and then cash value insurance. If you don't have a cash value policy, you need to get one. It's really important. You can use those. I call it love insurance. It's loving your family enough for two reasons. You're not dying and leaving them, and then they're crying because they're broke. Like, we have to stop allowing our kids to start from ground zero. And insurance is a way to be able to do that. When my kids graduated from high school, we were able to give them every, each one as they graduated, we gave them $100,000. They could not ball out. They had to invest it. And so that was a requirement to give it. And then make sure as a business owner, it's time. You guys got to get your estate stuff done. And if you don't know how things about how to minimize, I'm not going to say avoid tax. I heard somebody say that the other day, you can avoid paying taxes. I was like, you, sir, are going to jail. Like, <laughs> you keep getting on lives, talking about avoid taxes. You, the first rule of money is you got to learn the language. And so we want to minimize, right, <laughs> what we're 
given using the IRCs, the Internal Revenue Codes, because the codes were written by wealthy people for wealthy people. And so people can get mad about their taxes. Don't get mad. Just get on the right side of the tax codes. Right. And so there are there's more than just one kind of trust that you can get to help minimize your taxes. And so just learning what's available for you is impo important. So there were some questions. I think I lost them. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get them back myself. Yeah, shoot. Somebody, I remember one of them was somebody was asking you to talk about cycles. Um, you were talking about like, I had to learn the cycles. So can you talk yeah. So every asset class, no matter whether it's the bond market, it's the real estate market, now crypto has been around long enough for us if we just saw a crypto winner. So we know crypto has cycles also. And so you look at the different, every asset class, cash equivalents, every asset class has a cycle. And so it's important to know when the cycles are because all bubbles pop eventually. And you don't want to get in on an asset class cycle when the bubble's up here. Like, for instance, in real estate years ago in the 2008-2009 crash, we should not have been buying real estate during that time. One, we was paying way too much for it because it was over-evaluated. But during that time, I was listening to Tyrone the Barber, who I shouldn't have been listening to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand when quantitative easing, when they turned on the government, turned on the printing presses, what that was going to actually do to the economy. And so I had to learn all of that. And real estate has like an 18 to 20 year life cycle, give or take a few, depending on what else is going on in the economy. And so I said the bond market has a 28 to 30 year cycle to it. And so it's knowing when to get in and when to get out. And so I look at those sectors of the market very differently than what a retail investor would look like because I understand another thing, Shamika, that I started doing was following an app called iBillionaire mm -hmm. because billionaires set the tone for what goes on in our markets globally. And so I started doing things when I saw Carlos Slim Hilu and some of the other billionaires that I follow, when I saw them get out of the market and start doing, they were not buying any real estate in 2007, eight, we out here just buying and they were sitting on their cash. The reason they sat on their cash is because they knew the bubble was going to burst. When the bubble burst, they go in. Why? Everything was on sale. So they go, there's a, I started following and paying attention uh, to where they were putting their money. When Trump came to office, one of the things that they knew that eventually we were going to go to war. And so what do I do? I start buying stock in companies that support things that we need to a wartime, steel, rubber, oil. So those type of things. And so it's understanding the cycles how long they last and where you are in the cycle. And there are key indicators. People are like, I don't like looking at the news every day. The news is so negative. Yeah, it's negative, but I listen to it. I listen to it for signs on what's going on in the market. Another thing, if someone is interested, I think I sent you one of the things that I use is called the RG chart. And so it's real, it's called the relative ro late rotation graph. And so what it does is it shows you the strength and the weaknesses of different sectors in the market. And so it's one of the reasons why I know that energy dropped with the financial markets. And I know that industrials dropped with the financial market. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna put puts on those companies because I can make money when the market is going down. And that same chart shows you when there's a shift and they can start going up. So you can go long-term or short-term with this chart. And so these are some of the indicators that I use to help me with my investing. I love it. I lost most of the questions for some reason. I think one of them said something, maybe they can repost it, but I know, I think one of them was talking about if they had tens of thousands of dollars in the bank, what should they do? Or I think they were looking more like along the lines of what can they do with it to make it produce? I, you may feel differently. I think it will be very irresponsible of me to answer that when there's so many other questions that I have to ask you when people ask me that. The first thing I tell you is don't tell anybody else you don't know what to do. 
because if you don't know what to do with your money, there are plenty of crooks if out there. You don't know what to do. <laughs> and so my first investment really would be an investment in my education, my investing education. I am I'm a contrar- contrarian investor. I don't go with the herds. I don't like financial planners. I have one that I work with, but it's only from my direction. I'm saying, okay, this is where I want to be. I want to do this long term. I handle all my own short term stuff. But yeah, I think it's important for you to be able to educate yourself first. So you'll know, but do you have the, the assurances that we were talking about? Do you have your insurances in place? There are foundational things that I think are very important before we start just throwing money in markets. But your education is the first the investment that you should make. And then the second one would be an understanding learning cycles in markets because that's important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the one thing that people believe that they are, that it's great strategy to just delegate your learning. You cannot delegate your learning because you need to still be able to you can you still have to be able to direct someone on what they need to do with your money and so i think that one of the things that for example we get into shamika's house because we get into things that we know nothing about and we and someone will say you have no business doing that well yeah okay you're right i shouldn't but i can big i can get a crash course in something figure something out i can research i'm not gonna you're gonna invest in something you need to learn about it first you need to understand it you need to understand what are you not asking? So you go and you find out other people, not the people that you're dealing with for the investment. You find out through other people, what am I not asking? People that are experts in that in- industry. Right now, for example, there's a gold mine. We're investing in a gold mine. It, uh, it has water rights. We went and we investigated the whole area. What has been extracted in the areas? What hasn't been extracted? What reports? Like We had to get deep into figuring out since June to now. So it's been two different gold mines. When we got to the second one, guess what? We knew what we were asking and how we were asking and what we needed to know. We found out that all of the areas around there, doing investigating, we found out that all of the areas during our due diligence, we found out all of the areas around there, all the other mining rights in the area have been purchased by the biggest mining company from Canada. Well, guess what? They don't move quickly. So they've been buying it. They've been acquiring all those mining rights. At some point, they're going to go into production. Guess what? The one, the mining rights that we are negotiating right now, those have the only water rights in that whole zone. That already, we're already, it's not already an asset. We can collateralize it. We can do whatever we want. And we know at some point they're going to have to come to us to either buy us out or they're going to come to us to lease water rights from there because they're going to need water to mine. So even without the gold in the thing, now we look at gold and you're right, gold has been in a bearish market for few decades now and now it's going into finally going into a bull market so they're predicting it's going to be from june to now it would think in june it was like 1675 an ounce now it's i I don't know i didn't look at today but the last i looked had been at 1900 a few days ago and that looks like it just creeped up a little bit it hadn't really moved much in the last 20 years so there's that cycle for you with gold it's coming they're predicting next five to ten years it's going to be at 30,000 an ounce. Why? And then it gives you that. But you have to invest in, you have to go into and look at what you're investing in. You can't go in it blindly because your friend or your barber or whoever told you, because you have to look at what results they have first in that area before you listen to them. Because Tyrone is not all the stuff, right? It's not just the barber, it's Tyrone. Yeah, Tyrone look at her. Sorry. <laughs> Tyrone wasn't looking at the bar. Look, Tyrone can't read charts, and he was buying the Rocky Dinar. And I'm like, I'm spinning it now. <laughs> if our Rocky Dinar was worth anything, I don't think the people there would be so poor. But okay, that's where I got. I stopped listening to Tyrone. But it's important who you get your investment education from matters, and and I will tell you that. The information that millionaires and billionaires have access to is very different than what retail investors get. It's very different. I used to sit in the meetings years ago. I've been doing this for 30 years. And so I remember going to Wall Street, sitting in the meetings in Wall Street, thinking this is not the same information that financial planners are out here. First of all, I feel like financial planners are salespeople. 
and they can only give you what the programs that they have, the products that they have to offer. And it may not be in your best interest. I am a value-based investor also. And so I think learning what your investment style is very important also, because I get it. I'm a risk taker. My husband is not, which is why he got into insurance. All right. He is like, look, I got a wife just going to bet the whole house. Let me shore up some stuff. <laughs> I'm not afraid to take risks. Whereas he's like, look, we want this to be able to last. And so I think it's important too, that you understand that as a business owner, there should be a portion of your money that you are putting to work for you. If your money is not working for you, then you are missing out on opportunities and you have unemployed money. Your money got to do more than just go to the mall. And, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, your money shouldn't. Your money has an assignment. Every day I put my money to work for me. It Listen, making money as a business owner is just the beginning. It's people out here that are doing things like when I look at, I have a client who sold his business for a little over $20 million. And I didn't know them then, but they got hardly anything left. And I'm like, oh, what? financial planner would put you in these products. That is a job. Sometimes I forget that CDs and mutual funds even exist. I'm like, why, why would you put your money there? Like there are so many better options where you actually make more. You're not paying all your money out in fees, but learning about perpetual education funds that you can get inside of a charitable trust that you're not make. Cause if I was him, when I sold that company, all of my money would have went inside of a charitable trust just about. I could pay myself a salary out of it and save a couple hundred thousand dollars in taxes. And so as you start to make more money, just really learning about all the things that's out there for us, like perpetual education funds and there are other types of trust that are out there, but what works for you and your family? So it's not just where should I put my money? It's what works for you. What's your risk tolerance? What do you value? These are all should be a part of your investing conversation. I love it. I just want to share this statement I said earlier from the point of view of like your business. You are not in business to employ folks. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say it 10,000 times. You're not in business to employ people. And so what happened to me in 2008 is the reason why I was running through my savings is because I was trying to hold on to the employees because I felt obligated to them because the income I was giving them was their livelihood. And now I didn't even know how to make money. And so with that in the forefront of my mind, there was no banks for me to put loans with. I just want you guys to understand this. I had clients who were trying to get loans, but there were no banks to put their loans with. Everything was shut down. So I was literally paying salaries and paying money out of my pocket, companies laying off people right now because they're looking at their burn rate. They are looking at making sure that not only they have personal emergency savings funds, but they have it for their business. Does your business have enough cash flow, enough money to be able to survive at least a few months? You need to have a year, right? But a few months at minimum, and most business owners don't. So those are things you wanna be looking at right now in your company is where's that money going and where can you start to like slice things? That's why you see all these layoffs happening. Yeah. That's why you're seeing them happening everywhere because the CEOs of the companies are doing their doggone jobs. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And when they don't do their jobs, companies like Enron and not even just Silicon Valley Bank. There were other banks, the Republic Bank and the you know, Venture Bank. All listen. The, especially with Signature, they knew, they knew, they just wanted to bury their heads in the sand and try to hide it. But I saw a video that was leaked back in November where the powers to be in the banking industry were trying to figure out how they can hide it from the American people, the law. How can we put it off? Because they didn't want consumer confidence because they don't want people not spending money. And so... They know it. all of this is planned. They know exactly what they're doing. It's just that you have to read the signs of what's going on and prepare. And when you segregate your money, wealthy people segregate their money. When you start segregating your money, you have different, you have money that can carry you through periods like this. And it's not, and like you said, it, 
it's so global because even Credit Suisse also went down. And the Swiss the bank. one there is enough that everybody should be wondering. Because if they go under along with Deutsche Bank, those are big. That's like catastrophic worldwide because they have so many ties. It's like an octopus in every single industry in just about every single country. And you have countries now that are falling into negative interest rates. Eventually, that will hit the shores of the United States. Well, the people that saying we're not going to get a recession, don't worry, it won't be as bad as 2008, 2009. 2008, 2009 had the banking in the real estate industry. We have several industries that are in trouble right now. And the tech industry is a huge industry. So it's paying attention and doing something with your money that's very different. You made me think about something going back to 2008. I don't know if you guys remember this. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are very young, right? And so they haven't experienced this. I literally remember driving past a long and the parking lot just being empty. People were not spending money. I literally remember driving neighborhood after neighborhood like high-end neighborhood with boards on the windows, lots of foreclosures everywhere. There, right now, we're, I go to the mall and there's so many people spending money. It, it still looks good, but we are actually on the prefaces of what we experienced back then. And so again, one of the main reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is because I don't want you guys to get caught with your pants down. Start looking and start preparing, not in a chicken little kind of way, in a strategic way, in an intentional way. How do I shore up what I have? How do I shore up my legacy? How do I shore up my business? Get some clarity about who you're serving, how you're serving them, what's working now, what's not working. And don't be so married to everything right. you're doing that you're not afraid to let things go and shift some things and change up some things. Right. And for some who are have maybe not been interested too much or seeing themselves as entrepreneurs or business owners, I think that if you look at things from a little bit of a different perspective, maybe it's the starter part that really, that throws you off. But if you look at it from the perspective of you can actually acquire a business, you can acquire a business. There are so many baby boomer generation people that have good businesses, solid businesses that maybe they have quite a bit of opportunity for growth and for scaling up, but they have been running it in the way they, within the limitations of their capabilities and their know-how, maybe not leveraging online so much and, or just, just, we've always done it this way. And so we haven't really changed it, but it's producing. And now they want to retire and they want to sell off because none of their children or their, or their grandchildren are wanting to take over this business. But there are so many businesses and you can go from like small business all the way up through big business and you could actually purchase a business and you're like, well, how am I going to purchase a business? Well, guess what? Some people are running that business. And if it's run well, the owners are at home somewhere. They're old, they're retired. They're not even running the business. That business is running itself. And you can jump in there. It doesn't even have to be your own money. It could be an SBA loan because guess what? SBA, that is going to be the one. That's the one that's going to be lending still. The SBA is going to be a tool and a vehicle. They're still going to be lending, especially when things happen. Other loans shrink up but the SBA will be loaned and it'll be at a great interest rate. And so think about that. Think about what can I do to create, because, you know, if you're in a job and you're getting maybe a two, 3% interest rate, interest uh, percent, two or 3% raise, guess what? That's not even inflation. And that's when they used to lie to us and tell us that inflation was at one, two, 3%. Guess what? Now they're actually telling us it's at 9%. What does that tell you that our inflation is really at right now? So money in the bank is not going to get that. Is If you have $1 in the bank and inflation is hitting and you're only getting 0.1% on it, 0.2% on it, you're losing money every year on that money. So Kim, I say that all the time, savers are losers in an economy like this. And I grew up in a household where my grandfather was so big on saving. Right? And he will always tell me, make sure you have something left over. So for years, I was like, I got to have something left over. Even raising my kids, when I would give them money, I would match. If they went out with their friends and came back with money, I would match what they came back with to try to get them, program them into always having something left over. And then I hit a point where like, okay, grandpa, 
the bank ain't paying me no money on this. Like, this doesn't make sense. It may have worked in your generation after the depression, but it's not working for me. And so my strategy for making my money grow had to be very different than what my grandfather's strategy was because we're in a different economic cycle than what what he grew up in. I'm going to say one last thing, and I'm gonna, we're going to wrap this conversation up. The thing I want to say is an ode to something Carla said, because Carla was talking about the SBA still learning, and it made me think about a conversation that I had with someone. I don't remember where we were, but they were like, I don't want to take out any loans. And I'm like, if somebody else wants to give me their money for me to do something with, I'm taking it. So if you want to be on the other side of the wealth conversation, meaning not the poor side. Absolutely. You need to understand that you want to take your money and let your money work for you and then take somebody else's money and let their money work for you as well. So I think, what do I want to call it? In mass society, right? Credit is bad. Loans are bad. Savings good. And what you're hearing us say is, we don't want to save, we want to invest, right? We want to employ, like LaShawn says, we want to employ our money. And if someone wants to loan you money and you can take that money and make something different out of it, you can make more return on investment, they call that arbitrage, right? Then you want to take all the money somebody is willing to give you. So I just wanted to put that into this space for those of you who are clamping down and thinking it's time to start squirreling away peanuts you're going to be on the wrong side of the fence. Absolutely. But really quick before we end, Shamika, I think also that's why the whole infinite banking is also important for people that feel like that. When you have a cash value life insurance that you borrow against to go buy, like Carla said, another business or to be able to get real estate or invest to put your money to work. If you don't pay it back, who are you coming after yourself? I don't have to go through all of the red tape. I don't have to gather up any financial statements for the bank. I don't have to do any of that. And so with the whole infinite banking concept, it just, you don't want to have to deal with the SBA or all of that. You can still do what you need to do. It's how you structure it. I love it. So I want you guys to give them like your 60 second, I'm standing on my pedestal. Here's what I want to tell you. If the last thing that I can say to you that I think will make a difference in your life, if each one of you guys can share that, I could talk to you all day. Y'all know this. We could have this conversation. I know I'm about to put them on the spot. I'm going to bring them to Game On Live in November. <laughs> so we can rather these conversations. Yeah. Look at them all. Because I think these conversations are necessary and not a lot of them are having. And they're not being had by women of color. Yeah. And so... That's what I think is important. Somebody made a comment that it's really powerful to see women speaking about money so powerfully. And I am so grateful that I get to call you all my friends, but I know that a lot of people don't have access. And so my desire, that's why it says I am the prototype. My desire is to give more people access and types of conversations because they're game changing. You guys ready? Want to share your pedestal? Mod is not profound or anything. I just want to say seasons change. Your today is not your tomorrow if you don't want it to be. And economic times like this, people can get into fear and overwhelm, but you don't have to be fearful. This is, we're in a season of major opportunity. And so that's really what I wanted to end with seasons change. Yeah. So I know the type of people that, that are attracted to spring. And it's always going to be the person that can have a bigger version, vision of themselves than they are right now. And they are brave enough and they have the courage to go ahead and go after it. And so from that standpoint, what I'm going to tell you is that if you have that vision deposited into you, it's because you are meant to bring it to life. And in most cases, you are the game changer. You are the breakthrough generation in your lineage. And it is your responsibility to yourself, yes, and to your lineage, to those generations, the ones before, and all the sacrifices they went through and everything they've gone through for you to be right here right now and for those that are coming behind you, after you, to be able to learn to create that wealth. And when I say create wealth, income in large sums, wealth level income, and not limit yourself and not limit God, and then be able to learn to make to manage that wealth to make that wealth work for you as LaTron was talking about 
and make it work for you, but also the asset protection. The wealth protection is so important. And that's the part we miss out. We miss out on two as people of color. We miss out on two. We miss out on three. Those two steps, like we can go and we we create that income and we have the focus on creating the income. But then those other two steps is where we fall through the cracks. And that's when you don't see that breakthrough lasting through the generations. And so it is our responsibility to not just set ourselves up and our children up, but is of our children, of our children setting them up. And that comes to financial education. And that comes to instilling in them that it is their job that here, I am setting this up for you. I'm setting it up in such a way that it can be transferred to you, but I need to set you up in a way that you can take it even further than I have. And so that's the responsibility we have to them is to teach, to educate ourselves and teach them what they need to learn to be able to be the next Rockefellers. I told you guys you were twins. <laughs> I'm sitting here just thinking to myself, I'm so blessed that I do get to have this conversation and to be surrounded by women like both of you. I'm honored that you were willing to take time out of your day. LaShawn, you got your event happening. If you guys are in the DC area, she's probably sold out, but she might have some virtual something going on. Wealthy Revolution Live is happening. You guys, if you want to learn from LaShawn, that's going down this week. Can you want to share, LaShawn, a little bit about that? Yeah, you can go to WealthyRevolutionLive.com. It is our signature event that we have every year where we teach the first day is always about mindset, second day about money, and the third day is always about investing. And and it's real hands-on, not any fluff. And I got receipts from people who been able to multiply their money in from sixty thousand dollars to seven and eight figures. And we would love to have you. I am sold out of VIP. But there are still some other tickets left that you can get. So again, WealthyRevolutionLive.com. Thank you, sis. I always will make time for you. Thank you for having me. This conversation has been powerful. And I hope those of you who have been listening and tuning in, that you've heard something that lights a fire inside of you, that changes the game. Here's the deal. If you're only thinking about six figures in your business, you think it way too small. Because millions is easy. It's simple. Actually, let me roll that back. Take it back. Take it back. Take it back. It's simple, not easy. It is simple. The problem is you're likely plugged into the wrong places and listening to the wrong people. What what makes it dif difficult? My desire is that we normalize these types of conversations openly and honestly. My desire is that we normalize large sums of money. Car Carla said large and large. I'm going to say millions and billions. I want to make y'all uncomfortable. I want to normalize talking about millions and billions. I want to normalize having liquid hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? That needs to be your reality, especially if you're a business owner, why would you aim for anything less? And so I hope you've been supercharged today, inspired today, and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful that this is a conversation that we get to have and we will have plenty more. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and we'll see you next time. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching my show, my channel. Here's what I want you to do. If you really love what you've been listening to, I want you to subscribe to my channel and leave me a comment. No, no, wait, leave a comment. Like right now.